Good morning. morning. Glad to see all of you beautiful people. Uh, This morning, what we're going to be discussing is a cure for racism. (laughs) Okay, I'm done. (laughs) No, in reality, we've all been talking about racism a great deal, but what we haven't really discussed in any meaningful way is what we do to go about bringing an end to it. How do we cure it? Right? And I'm using the word cure, ambitious, I know, but it's what I want us to focus on while we talk this morning, okay? So I have a question, very quickly. How many of you are prejudiced? Complete trick question. The reality is, we are all prejudiced. Okay, now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Think of it in this way, right? What role does prejudice play and how does it come about? Well, we start to form these opinions, and if we're talking about prejudice, in reality, these are opinions that aren't founded in any experience. They aren't founded in any substantial contact with that individual or that entity, right? So we actually don't know everything we believe we know about the person. We form this opinion based on typically what we've been told or what we see in front of us, not actual experience. That's prejudice, okay? Separate from racism. Racism is an extreme form of prejudice. And so, when you're thinking about racism, what I want you to focus on and the difference between the two is the malicious intent. Racism, in fact, is act. Discriminatory practices, okay? Let's come back to that. Why do we have so much difficulty talking about racism? Well, often it's the stigma that is associated with the word. When I asked how many of you were prejudiced, the place got very still. I mean, we're talking about several hundred people. I mean, and it literally got still. Not me. Not raising my hand. Maybe he can see me. I can't. (laughs) But... (laughs) But what I want to do in focusing on this topic in a cure for racism is to indicate to you that what we're going to use is the science of psychology, right? The idea that I've developed is that racism is in fact a psychiatric illness. It behaves like a psychiatric illness. It looks like a psychiatric illness, falls into those same bounds. And so we can go about treating it and effectively curing it like it's a psychiatric illness. So, if you think about other psychiatric illnesses, what goes from being the general human condition to being a disorder is this spectrum that they fall on. That's all. That's the fundamental root of the practice of psychology. A part of the general human experience is sadness, yes? We all experience it. You've done poorly on a test, someone hits your car, your insurance goes up, someone dies who you love. You don't get into that school you applied to. You got fired from your job. We experience sadness, correct? On the other end of the spectrum of sadness is major depression. And it has its own signs and symptoms. But most of us at some point in our life are gonna fall along points of this spectrum. Here over in sadness, I failed the test. Somewhere in the middle, someone in my family died or all the way over to major depression. Same thing for anxiety. On this far end, the general human experience is worry, is nervousness. And on the extreme end is panic, agoraphobia, generalized anxiety disorder. So let's move it forward because we're talking about racism. So on this end is prejudice, which we've already agreed we all experience. It's part of the general human condition, right? You're walking in the vista, You see five young African-American men wearing hooded sweatshirts coming towards you. Chances are pretty good many of you in here are going to become somewhat nervous, correct? No need to lie about that, folks. (laughs) I would be somewhat nervous, yes? (laughs) And so I live in Lexington. If I'm walking along a street in Lexington and I see five young Caucasian men and their heads are bald and they have tattoos, I'm going to start to make certain assumptions about them. That's the general human experience of prejudice, right? 
on the extreme end of that spectrum is racism. The intent to do harm. So if we in fact look at a policy like say stop and frisk in New York City, I'm sure you've heard of it, let me outline it for you. The New York Police Department outlined a practice wherein police officers were directed to stop and literally frisk young African-American and Latino men in certain neighborhoods. Specifically, African-American and Latino men. What's important there is the power that these police officers have over these men. Racism has to have that intent. I have to be able to do this thing, separate from prejudice. So have you seen where it falls on the spectrum now? Okay. So moving forward, what we've indicated is, well, what I've indicated is we can somehow cure this, yes? It's insidious, and we're all talking about it, and it's harmful. And that's how we know that it's a disorder, but I'm going to call it an illness. It's not enough to call it a disorder because of the stigma involved. And why psychology is so important in this cure is because psychology and psychologists are critical in destigmatizing mental illness. Suicidality became a conversation because of the study and application of work done by psychology and psychologists. Schizophrenia and its science and its study and its practice and application and work and therapy around it done by psychologists using psychology practices. You're welcome. The understanding that we want to have with regard to using psychology is we're going to take a stage approach to curing racism. The importance of this work extends beyond that though, right? If we're going to work on an individual, we might as well work on ourselves. So I'm pretty sure no one in here has ever done anything racist. But we also want to make this preventative. What's the use of a cure if it can't also help us to stave off illness, right? So two stages, curative, preventative. So let's leap right into it, see what we come up with. First, what we have to have, the most critically important part of any practice in curing racism is going to be mindfulness. Knowing that I feel this way and I'm doing this thing. Being aware of what these signs and symptoms are. How does it impact other people? When I do something, I'm not simply doing it. There's intent behind it, and it's harming someone. Mindfulness. Processing, which is also going to include perspective taking. See, we as a community of thinkers and people are not going to help individuals who are racist recover if we don't, in fact, understand where they are and what their experience is. Yes, there are some racist crimes, but the racists themselves are human beings. The same way someone with drug addiction is a human being who does terrible things but can recover. And if there is no place for them to recover, to come to, if there is no landing spot for their humanity, what are they going to return to? What they were already doing. Exposure. We're going to need to expose ourselves and individuals who are racist to healthier ideas and healthier relationships and healthier ways of being. Lastly, community reintegration and support. Literally, when we bring them back to us, we have to support them. We have to give them ourselves, okay? Sounds easy, right? You with me on this? Can we do it? Okay, <laughs> so let me give you an example. And thank you for that over there. <laughs> when I was a graduate student in New York City, I was a volunteer and I was working with a young white man who, in fact, was in a juvenile detention center. Now, you can imagine being in any urban center and being white in a juvenile detention center is pretty difficult. 
He was one of seven white males in this detention center. There were about 300 of these young men, mostly African American and Latino. So they were literally fighting for their lives every day. So one of the counselors says, listen, you had success with this other guy who was stabbing people. I want you to work with him. Wait a minute. This guy? Now, I knew from a couple of his tattoos and his background, this was probably going to be a match made in hell, correct? <laughs> but I walked in. First thing he says, look, I'm not talking to you. We're done here. Just going ahead about your business. But we started to talk more. And this is when this idea started to come to me, okay? First thing, I have to help him to be mindful of his experience while I affirm him. I wasn't going to approach him and say, you know what, you should love all African-American people. Even though I may love almost all African-American people, the young African-American boys who he spent most of his time with were trying to literally beat him to death every day. So I wanted to affirm that reality, but to also say to him, when you get out of here, you're going to go back to some of those relationships you had with African Americans in parts of Queens and Brooklyn, which are healthy. So I want you to acknowledge your reality, but then separate this out. This is contextual. This is happening here. Be mindful of that. Be mindful that your thinking has been impacted by others. A couple of the older boys, who in fact were calling themselves skinheads, were in his ear every day. Do you see how they are? I can't believe you're working with this guy. This nigga's getting in your head. And so a part of what I then had to do was to say, let's process that. What does that mean to you? What does our working relationship mean to you? What would progress look like? And he started to open up more. He started to be able to identify that our relationship, his relationship with a young African-American man was a healthy one and was supportive and he was fully engaged. Exposure. This is critically important on both ends. Because in reality, the evidence that we pursue and engage is going to inform our opinion and our psychology. So if I listen to nothing but Southern rap music every day, and I was an alien from another planet, I'd be frightened of black people. <laughs> frightened, scared to death. If I only looked at pawnbroker wives, I'd be scared of Southern white people. I say all of that to say that what we have to do, must do, then, is engage healthier examples. He was able to say to himself and to me, he has a relationship with an African-American man from the city who was in his 20s at that time, who was educated, who was a friend. So he was able to begin to access other information. Well, what about that guard who protects me? What about those African-American boys who don't jump in when that fight happens? Last thing, community support. Even though he was shaving his head and had these homemade tattoos, he eventually, in less than a year at that point, was going to return to his community if we, in fact, re-stigmatize races after we've engaged with them, we give them no opportunity to be a part of the community again. It is the exact opposite of a cure. We are chasing them back toward those symptoms. We are isolating and ostracizing them. We are literally making them unhealthy. And so the urge may be to look at them and say, well, this is a choice. But what we're outlining right now is what evidence there is. That people respond to stimuli and their environment. And that's all he was doing, right? He was released, returned to his community, 
And for the brief period of time that I was in touch with him, for all intents and purposes, he had at least partially recovered. And so, what we want to do in looking at this cure is not just extreme cases like that. We want to begin to access ourselves. Here's the preventative piece, right? Part of the difficulty I have always had, part of the failure I think we have experienced as a nation and as a society in discussing the issue of race is we have failed to properly educate all of ourselves. We walk into these dynamics, we walk into these settings, and we say, you know what, we need to educate all of the white people. Here's what you're doing wrong, white people. Here's everything you're saying wrong. Here's how you're offending all of us. Just give us some of your power and your privilege and we'll be fine. And what it fails to do is to approach that part of the cure that in fact says, take perspective, process. There are white men and women and people in our community who are scared to say what they think and we need to affirm them. There are black men and women in our community who are scared to approach and we need to empower them. And so I'm both fearful and encouraged by where we are because it feels as if our nation has already started this process to a degree of healing, even in the midst of tragedy. I'm fearful as an African-American man and the father of an African-American son because I have to educate him about these realities and what to expect and what dangers there may be. But I'm encouraged when I look and see entire communities of people, white men and women, Asian, Latino men and women, black men and women, walk out in front of our police with their hands up and say, don't shoot and black lives matter. And what I see happening is I see people empowering themselves. I see the changes that have occurred. We didn't have a black president elected on just the strength of his community and on communities of color. You may not want to hear that, but it's true. It was a family affair that got that done. What has changed most in our nation is our majority. There have always been talented golden children in a black community and in a brown community, but their brilliance is now being embraced more by our white family. And it's okay if we say that and embrace that and decide that now is the time for us to heal and be cured. Let's go TEDx, all right? Thank you. <laughs>